They even led the passengers in singing Israeli songs after the hijackers had been subdued. Only those in the forward section saw the entire hijack attempt. Now, can you tell us very briefly what has happened? Yes, there were two hijackers. They were sitting in front of me. I assume they were hijackers. They got on, uh, they got up at the beginning of the... Uh, as we had come to our complete ascent, I guess, because we still had our seatbelts on, and they got up and they said, ah, like that, and they, one had a gun and the other had two grenades, and they ran into the front of the plane and they tried to get the, to, the, um, to the pilot, the, the doors were locked. They, of course, um, hit the, uh, they shot the steward, and the Secret Service man came up there, directed the people, the plane wavered. We all thought we were going down, but it was a maneuver of the pilot. Uh, to get them off balance. They were shot, and, um, and of course, one of them was caught, and they tied them up with ties, whatever we could get, string, whatever. Did you everybody. get caught in this? Uh, no, I didn't. There was a one young man from America, a very young fellow, who uh, grabbed them, uh, grabbed the girl with her by her hand, um, and where she had the two grenades, and he did this completely by himself. I don't know where he got the courage, but he, he still he was a brave young man. Myself, I wasn't feeling good. I was taking an aspirin, and all of a sudden I heard a yell. When I turned my head and I was sitting by, by the aisle, I saw uh, I saw a lady, a woman, dark complexed, in a dark dress, I think, and holding two hand grenades. And a fellow vis-a-vis -vis was holding a gun. And uh, well, of course, the panic it was great. And then I, see, I saw a man walking over straight with his hands up and he, like he was knocking in the pilot's door to open up with his left hand I saw and here the girl was standing right in the side and he knocked straight you know face. So what, one of the passengers hit the man with the gun? Uh, hit the girl with the girl, not with the gun. I saw him with his hand he hit her right in her face. He fell back. And then the commotion of fighting came on. Um, we were about six shots, you heard, and then, then one fellow got up in a white uniform, I guess uh, that was the steward, he was all blooded, all away, and he fell back to the floor. Um, for a while the panic was great, of course, and uh, the co-pilot came out and he said, sit down, let it be, quiet, everything is under control, you've got them tied up, and then the pilot himself came out. And but said, there was no fighting at all in the cockpit? No. They didn't open the door until everything was over. Also, three other jets were hijacked, and apparently it was all a carefully planned operation. One was Pan American, one was TWA, and one was Swiss Air, all headed for New York. The Pan American was a jumbo 747 jet with 170 people aboard. It was hijacked as it left Amsterdam and forced to fly to Beirut, Lebanon, where it landed safely on a runway surrounded by police. The TWA flight was a 707 with 145 people from Frankfurt to New York. It was hijacked and forced to fly to Jordan. And the Swiss Air was a DC-8 with 155 people flying from Zurich to New York, hijacked to Syria. The Palestinian guerrillas publicly claim credit for all four. This is NBC Sunday Night News, September 6th, 1970. Israel said today it is pulling out of the Middle East peace talks until the military situation along the Suez Canal is restored to what it was before the ceasefire. The Israeli cabinet issued a statement in Jerusalem saying it still accepted the American proposal for a ceasefire and for peace talks, but that the talks could not go on while the other side cheated. Officials in Jerusalem told reporters that the last straw to the Israelis was evidence that the cheating was still going on after Washington had asked Cairo and Moscow to stop the violations. The Israeli delegate to the Uni peace talks, Ambassador Yosef Tekoa, will carry this word to the United Nations in New York, where the talks were to have taken place. They may still take place, but the UN was pretty gloomy this afternoon in any case. We have a late bulletin from the British Broadcasting Corporation, according to Reuters news agency, which says Israeli troops have entered Jordan. The BBC says Israeli troops crossed over into Jordanian-held territory shortly after nightfall tonight. David? 
In Washington, the State Department said nothing in public, and in private it said only it was disappointed and did not necessarily see this as the end of the peace talks that it hoped they would begin before this month was over. President Nixon is in San Clemente, California. At the San Clemente White House today, American officials are not particularly concerned by the Israeli decision. They concede it is a fairly tough diplomatic move, but do not feel that the chances for the Yaring talks have been seriously hurt. Presidential News Secretary Ronald Ziegler referred to the move this afternoon as apparently meaning a delay in the talks. People here were not surprised. They have been following the mood of the Israeli cabinet. They think there is a legitimacy to the Israeli attitude that if the Russians and Egyptians are not going to honor the present ceasefire, then why go further? It is also recognized here that the Israelis want to see how the United States performs, whether it can make the American peace initiative really stick. Even if today's move by the Israeli cabinet is not viewed here as too serious in itself, American officials do think it could be a stepping stone toward possibly more serious actions by the Israelis, perhaps military ones. Altogether, U.S. officials are extremely anxious to preserve the ceasefire and don't want to do or say anything to jeopardize it. But the critical issue remains, the missiles that, according to American evidence, the Egyptians have moved into the ceasefire area. American officials have been communicating with the Egyptians and the Russians, trying to get them to move the missiles out, but there has been no meaningful reaction yet. Herbert Kaplow, NBC News, in San Clemente. NBC has learned the substance of Egypt's reply to the United States over charges it has violated the ceasefire by moving missiles into the standstill area west of the Suez Canal. The UAR denied it had moved any new missiles into the forbidden zone. Then the UAR asked the United States these questions. What reply does it have to Cairo's complaints that Israel has been violating the ceasefire? Can the United States guarantee the United Arab Republic that Israel will not attack Egyptian positions during the ceasefire? If there is such an attack, what specific action will the United States take against Israel to honor the American guarantee? Egypt also said that when it accepted the Rogers proposal for peace talks, it was assured the United States would not supply Israel with planes during this time, thus adding to its military superiority. But Cairo says Israel has received American electronic devices and guided missiles, and Secretary of Defense Laird has promised Israel phantom jets. Today, Ambassador El Zayat of the United Arab Republic was asked for comment on Israel's decision to take no further part in the Middle East peace talks until, as it says, Egypt observes the ceasefire. It is uh, without joy uh, that I tell you this was not unexpected. As a matter of fact, when in July the government of the UAR took its historical and far-reaching decision to accept what was called then the American initiatives, we thought that we are doing that on the strength on, on the strength of our belief of the goodwill and of the determination of Washington, not anyone else. Because we thought that what Washington told us, that Israel is finally uh, desirous of living in peace within secure and recognized boundaries <coughs> without any further expansion was something that the UAI, that USA government was able to be assured of and was able to assure. Then came the question about the violations of the ceasefire. The violation of the ceasefire story has been I mean, explained to your government in an official document, which I'm not free to speak about now. However, I won't tell you this. We admit that inside the what is called ceasefire zone or the standstill zone we did exchange one dummy to another living missile or vice versa when we were asked by your government on the 18th of august and that this when we were told that is the understanding this is a violation we put our case saying if we don't do that and there is a surprise attack then again, what has happened on the 5th of June, 6 7, will be repeated. Egyptians have to prove that they can keep their word. It is to say, the rollback, the withdrawal of the missiles, 
that were introduced into the standstill area after the ceasefire. How many individuals are involved here? How, what, what's your estimate? Well, uh, there are many missile sites, above 10, 10 missile units that have been introduced into an area in the proximity of the Suez Canal, uh, which they couldn't do prior to the ceasefire entered into effect, and the construction of many more sites, again, which they couldn't uh, carry out prior to the entrance of the ceasefire into effect. Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir said in a radio interview tonight that the United States is trying to restore the former military situation along the canal. The impression left by American officials last week is that they would settle simply for no more violations. Mrs. Meyer, according to Reuters, will arrive in New York on the 17th of the September and in Washington on the 25th. The Israelis today denied a Lebanese accusation that their forces had gone back into Lebanon following the big Israeli raid which ended yesterday. And this is what it looked like during the raid as Israeli planes, armored vehicles, and infantry struck at Arab guerrilla camps in these rugged hills. The Israelis took no casualties, 13 guerrillas died. Practically no civilians remain here, where visitors used to watch Lebanese and Israeli farmers working peacefully in adjacent hills. It is said that all along the Lebanese-Israeli border, 25,000 Lebanese have become refug refugees since the Arab guerrillas and the Israelis began fighting here. It's not the drink that kills on our highways, it's the drunk. The problem drinker, the abusive drinker, the drunk driver. Look at all he's done for us. Added color to our highways. to eliminate the overcrowding in our schools. Brought families together. After all he's done for us, shouldn't we do something for him? If he's sick, let's help him. But first, let's get him off the road. Do something. Write the National Safety Council and your voice will be heard. NBC Sunday Night News continues after this announcement. And now a word from the people whose job it is to fill this screen. With the expected and often the unexpected. The special. In September, for example. The story of Western man. In Civilization, a preview on NBC. On CBS, the story down here is Apollo 11 landed on the moon. A day in the life of the United States. On ABC, The Unseen World, from a cavity in a human tooth to this rare view of the sun. Today's Eskimo moving into the 20th century in The Ice People on NBC. On CBS, a look at America, where it's been, where it's headed, seen through its music. The story of George M. Cohan is shown in George M. on NBC. Today's reality is squarely faced in POW, Next of Kin on ABC, about captured Americans and their families. Television, in action every day, entertainment and information every day, but not in an everyday way. We make it special. The United States today gave the Cambodians six new utility helicopters worth in all a million and a half dollars, and more will be delivered tomorrow. Americans say the ships will be used for medical and logistic purposes. Today, incidentally, was the 19th anniversary of the first direct American aid agreement with South Vietnam. And in Saigon, American officers said three squadrons of Marine fighter bombers will be sent home to be followed possibly by a couple of Marine infantry regiments. These sources also said that the plans now call for a force of only 20 to 40,000 Americans to be left in Vietnam by the end of 1972. Saigon is a city that is bursting at the seams. It was once called the Paris of the Orient. Now it's an overcrowded, dirty place to live. 
In the past 10 years, Saigon's population has grown from a half million people in 1960 to almost 3 million now. Traffic and resultant air pollution have become unbearable. The sewage system can't handle the load. Schools are overcrowded. And yet people continue to move in because the city is more secure than the countryside. Many of the refugees who found themselves homeless after Tet of 1968 are still living in camps scattered throughout the city. During the enemy's Tet Offensive, 33,000 homes were destroyed in Saigon. 300,000 people were without a place to live. The director of the refugee center in Cholan said they get practically no aid from the government. Chan Chi is in need of some help. She says she's been living here for three years. She moved into the camp when her home was bombed by terrorists. For the past two years, the government has promised to move her into a new apartment building, but nothing has happened. Meanwhile, she's opened a small soup stall in the camp. Chan Chi says that she sometimes sells five bowls of soup a day and earns about 25 cents. She has three children to feed. Chu Chan is in better shape. He and his family of seven live off the money he earns making picture frames. They all live in this small one-room shack. Chu Chan has been living in the camp here for the past two years. His home was destroyed by a fire during a battle between government forces and the Viet Cong. All of the 10,000 people living in this refugee center are waiting for the completion of a large housing project several blocks away from the camp. They've all been promised homes in the new apartment buildings when they're finished. Some of the buildings are already completed and people are living in them. The next group will be ready in about four months. Construction work in Vietnam is always agonizingly slow. This project is no different. When it's completed, it'll house 4,000 of the refugees now in the Cholan Center. But that's less than half of the refugees there. And there are hundreds of other refugee centers throughout the country. Lou Davis, NBC News, Cholan. Dr. Salvador Allende, who won the presidential election in Chile, is a physician who never had a live patient. He only did autopsies. He drives a sports car, lives in an elegant chalet, wears only the most expensive clothes, and drinks the best whiskey. Also, he is the only Marxist who ever won a free election anywhere in the world. In the pre-dawn hours of Saturday, the people known here as the Broken Ones, the Rotos, surged into the streets to celebrate the first place in the presidential election won by longtime Marxist Dr. Salvador Allende. Foreign policy isn't a fundamental issue in Chile. Allende won because he was more popular with the poor and promised them more than either of the other two candidates, and because the other two split the vote which opposed Allende. One possible obstacle now seems to remain to Allende's assuming the presidency, the attitude of the military. Tanks, armored cars, and troops surrounded the presidential palace early Saturday. Some observers speculated the troop movement could be the beginning of a coup, which rumors said might take place if Allende won. It wasn't. But both pro and anti-Allende Chileans are uncertain about the military's intentions. The left says that a military intervention would lead to civil war. Meanwhile, Allende, now called President-elect Allende by his followers, met with foreign correspondents. He said that the fundamental goal of his government would be to solve the basic problems of human life, something he claimed no Latin American government, except Cuba's, had succeeded in doing. Allende said the road chosen by Chile might, depending on circumstances, serve as an example elsewhere in the hemisphere. He's a man of large aspirations. Allende obviously sees his victory as having an impact beyond Chile in the rest of Latin America. If he can accommodate, as he says he wants to, Marxist economics with Chilean political democracy, he'll do something that has never happened before in the history of the world. Tom Streithorse, NBC News, Santiago, Chile. 
In Philadelphia, the Black Panther Convention continued today with about 6,000 people attending. All days off have been canceled for Philadelphia's 7,000 policemen, but so far everything has been orderly, if somewhat bombastic. But in South Minneapolis, in the pre-dawn hours today, the air was rent by a terrific blast as a bomb went off. The man presumably carrying the bomb was killed. The bomb exploded on a sidewalk in front of a row of aging wooden frame houses. They face a busy freeway which leads from the Minneapolis south side to the downtown loop. It happened during an electrical storm. Police are speculating that lightning caused the blast. There were only fragments of the victim and positive identification will take time. Most of the damage was confined to the two-story house in front of which the bomb exploded. A week-old baby inside was hit by flying glass, but the infant was not seriously injured. Police were checking out reports that the man thought to be carrying the bomb was headed for a rendezvous with an accomplice. One detective said, now we need to know where he came from, where he was going, and who he was. Police are also trying to determine the type of explosive. One of the first of the scene of the blast was a service station attendant who was on duty a block away. Thought uh, maybe someone had gone by on the freeway and threw a stick of dynamite out and kept going. And I turned around and came back to the station and then a few minutes later, the fellow that was sitting here talking with me came back and said that someone had blown a house up behind the station. And uh, it made me scared, and I called for someone to come and lock the station up, and the phone was dead. And I don't know, I just wanted to get away from here. Today's explosion was the eighth in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area in the past five weeks, but the first involving a fatality. A police source said of a possible connection between the bombings, I'm sure there is some loose tie. This is Stan Turner reporting from Minneapolis. President Leonard Woodcock of the Automobile Workers Union says today a strike would be bad for the country and his members don't want it. But he said they need more money. The deadline he has set is September 14th. In New York City today, the computerized machine that measures the city's air pollution gave a good reading today, showing clean, clear air. But it turned out the air was as dirty as ever. The computer wasn't working. Not so long ago only the few could go down that long road to college. Now there's many more who must go through that door that opens on the future of our land. It's where the future is, it's where they go to grow. It's where horizons start, but there's one thing you should know. For colleges to stand, they need your help in hand. The time is now to help us build a future. The future's being shaped at college today. But tuition pays only one-third the cost of education in college. Help with the other two-thirds. Join the future. Give to the college of your choice. Earlier on this program, we reported... Uh, from the Reuters news agency, a report by the BBC that Israeli troops had moved into Jordan. Uh, that statement has now been retracted by the people who make it. For some time, the U.S. Navy has been faced with the problem of sending orders to nuclear missile submarines underwater in wartime conditions. One solution was a scheme to put in a vast underground radio antenna network in Upper Wisconsin. But when word of this got around, there was an uproar from the conservationists and the Navy backed away. But the testing, if not the construction of the system, continues, and here is what it looks like today. This is the Shawamigan National Forest in northern Wisconsin. Because of the excellent hunting, fishing, and the many resorts along the pine-rimmed lakes, this is one of the most popular vacation areas in the Midwest. A 28-mile-long dummy antenna capable of carrying 2 million watts of electricity has been strung on poles through these north woods by the U.S. Navy. The Navy has also built a transmitter and a laboratory in the forest and has spent $32 million on research for what is known as Project Sanguine. If they build Sanguine, the project could cost more than $1 billion. 
A network of underground cables and transmitters would provide one-way signals to missile-carrying submarines at depths up to 1,500 feet anywhere in the world. To do this, the antenna must be thousands of miles long. This system could cover the upper one-fourth of Wisconsin. Laboratory technicians are trying to find out what effect such a powerful antenna would have on telephones, television, fences, and even water pipes in the area. Most of the residents of the town of Clam Lake, Wisconsin, say the Navy has always paid the cost of eliminating any difficulties caused by the research, and the town has benefited economically. It helps the area definitely. I mean, the workers around helps all the business people in Clam Lake. And I can't see any disadvantage in it being out there where it's at. I'm sure the Navy uh, would be the first ones to take it out if they thought there was going to be any harm. That's why they have this site here, is to test it out and see what's going to happen. You can call it flag waving if you want to, which a lot of people I see and hear on TV today think that's a crime. But I love my country and I'm all for anything that will help protect us. The antenna could be laid out in a tic-tac-toe arrangement beneath the national forest with cables crisscrossing every six miles. Opponents of Project Sanguine are worried about the effects of an electromagnetic field on the ecology of this area. I have grave questions that have not been answered. Uh, ecologically speaking, what is going to happen to our game, what's going to happen to our fish? They don't seem to really be worried about that, but they haven't any answers. The ecologists are worried about it. And of course that would destroy my business. This is our 50th year here as a family operating this business. And it's our lifetime work, so naturally I'm concerned. What kind of answers are you getting from the Navy? We aren't getting any answers from the Navy. That's our problem. We ask questions, but we get no answers whatsoever. Nobody seems to have the answers, even to simple questions. There is one other thing worrying the people of the Northwoods. Many feel the Navy's Project Sanguine might set a dangerous precedent for turning national parklands set aside for the enjoyment of people into defense compounds. Dick Kay, NBC News in the Shawamigan National Forest. Officials in Washington said today that project may not get any better. Thank you and good night for NBC News. See three separate nights at the Billy Graham New York Crusade in Shea Stadium this Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on WSM-TV. See Paul Eels with computer football starting Thursday. The Labor Day...